and welcome everyone. Um, <clears throat> this is part of the, uh, I say, a trio of presentations that I've uh, done, that I've been doing at this conference, at this event. There were two tutorials in the last two days, one about BGP, where in a day we went through what BGP means and, uh, and how it is. Uh, then yesterday, together with Tom and uh, Peter, who is not in the room, or at least I don't see him, um, we had a, we gave a tutorial about PF. And then this is a talk where I wanted to show you like a little bit of uh, a journey that I took with uh, an autonomous system, AS58280, which is on my name, and how I did it with, uh, with FreeBSD mostly. Um, so let's start from who, who I am. I am, I used to work at the Ripen CC, an internet society. So I have a past with uh, the people who distribute numbers. And when I say numbers, I talk about IP addresses and autonomous system numbers. So I was the IPv6 program manager at the Ripen CC for a while. And I worked at the internet society helping people establish new internet exchanges, establish community networks. And in a way, when I did that, I wanted to have a playground where I could try things before I would go out and, uh, and, uh, and push them, push people to, to actually do them. So I wanted to have my own network, and we'll get to that. Um, I help uh, running two internet exchanges. They are community driven. Uh, CHIX is in Zurich, and uh, IXP.g is in Georgia, and I like to say Georgia Tbilisi rather than Georgia Atlanta. It's not uh, <laughs> south of here, it's very east of here. Uh, I'm in the program committee of the right meeting, um, and the program committee of URIX, which is the association that puts together all the, or almost all of the uh, European internet exchanges. Um, DKNOG, of which I have a t-shirt as well. I'm on the board of SWINOG. I'm a part of the Italian FreeBSD users group. I run my own autonomous system, and I run a company where I do trainings mostly. And it's just uh, a new thing. So a little bit of introduction before I start. Um, I have to make a confession. I know I am very, very lucky for the situation that I will show you in a moment. I found out I could get something for very cheap. It's a good condition. We have exactly where I live, which actually restricts also the places where I could move, because I don't want to move outside of the town where I live, because I would lose the good uh, things I have here. So before we go into, into more detail, people who were at my tutorial have already seen this. Uh, if you want to run BGP, what do you need? You need three pieces. One is IP addresses. You need your own network. You need an autonomous system to announce them. And then the hardest part, because these two, the numbers, you can get them. Independently of where you live, you can get them from, from your regional registry for a price. Or you can find someone who can sponsor you to get them from Ripen CC, because uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily have to live in, uh, in Europe to, to get um, resources from the Ripen CC. But the, the hardest part at one point becomes interconnection, because it has costs. You need to have the right locations, and you need to have the right conditions for it to happen. So you could get addresses and autonomous systems easily. But interconnection is way more complicated. And so that's the part where I tend to concentrate. So in July 2019, so I stopped working at the RIPE NCC in, uh, on the 28th of um, June 2019. On the 1st of July, you can see in the records, I got my membership at the RIPE NCC. Because if you're an employee, you cannot get it. You cannot do that. You cannot get your own resources. But as soon as I left, I wanted to get my own resources. So I got my autonomous system, AS58280, and the slash 22 IPv4, and the slash 29 IPv6, which is the 
most common setup these days for, um, for members in, uh, in the region. And initially what I did was I put them to use on Vulture because you can do bring your own IP. I just had a normal internet connection at home from uh, actually Init7, which is a well-known ISP in, uh, in Switzerland. And actually, do you know what Init7 does that is particular? They, they, they're always on, in the news, in the networking community. Has anybody ever heard about Init7? It's, a, it's an interesting ISP. In, well, if you're German, yes, you have, most, most likely. Sorry? Austrian. Austrian, sorry. Um, basically, it's an ISP that operates in Switzerland, and you can buy connectivity from them, and when you order it, you can decide the speed you want. And uh, it costs the same. You can get one gigabit, you can get 10, or you can get 25. The difference is the setup cost, because for 25 and 10, the optics are a little bit more expensive, of course. But you can decide if you want 25 gigs, you can get 25 gigs. They, they have the infrastructure to deliver it wherever they want. So they'll sell you 25 just for the price of the optics? <coughs> It's you pay one price and then you the ports you decide which one you want. Yes. So I need to move to Germany. Sorry. So I need to move to Germany. Switzerland. Germany. They are in Switzerland, not in Germany. Close yeah, <laughs> actually they are the same organization who fought against because uh, every, and this is going to be part of, of what you'll see why, in uh, all around Switzerland, um, every fiber is point to point, and then some. A couple of years ago, uh, Swisscom decided to start deploying instead point to multipoint, so GPON. This company in its seven took them to court because they, they, they claimed they went to the competition commission and uh, they claimed that if you have a point to multipoint, if you have GPON, you don't allow competition. And they won recently, so now Swisscom will have to remove all the point to multipoint and put down point to point everywhere uh, as well. So. It's, a, it's actually a good thing. So I started with some small virtual machines, some tests, but uh, then I, I, something happened. In 2019, October, I gave a presentation in Bern and I met a person called Sylvan. Sylvan runs freetransit.ch, which is by the name, you get free transit. You, you can get bandwidth from them as part of the open factory uh, offers. Um, we discussed, and then Sylvan told me, hey, but uh, where do you live? I live, I live, in, a, I live in a small town called uh, Brittisellen. And his eyes lit up and said, oh, so you can get, you can get fiber then. I said, well, I have, I do. No, 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 you can get it in a different way. I can help you with that. And um, turns out that he had some ideas. And then I discovered that I had a neighbor. So I'm putting, I'm giving you different pieces of the puzzle. I discovered I had a, I have a neighbor that's also a networker. It's called Pim van Pelt. So I, in uh, late 2019, I knocked on his door and said, well, I think I found a way for us to do something particular with, uh, with, the ne with networking. Um, would you like to, to join me? And at first, he wasn't really of the idea. But then a few days later, he, he wrote me back and said, well, let's, let's see what we can do. So what, we, what happened was we started with a switch. In May 2020, we put a switch at the local exchange. And together with Sylvan, we could get fibers. You can see we have four ports available <laughs> on this little switch. Um, I don't know if you, if you know, if you know the, the, if you look at the back of this switch, so this costs 180 francs at the time. Are there baby francs? Yeah. Um, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a microtic switch. Yes. And, <laughs> you know, it works. And last week, there was a picture exactly like this one, and they use it to run the right meeting network. So don't laugh at it, please. It works. But this happened. So we got fibers. We got optics. We connected. 
and, uh, and then what happened later was more interconnection. So in May 2020, first transit, it was open factory. In October 2020, I connected to a new internet exchange, CHIX. Uh, then I started helping running CHIX right off. Then I had a new transit because as soon as I connected to the exchange, someone, someone uh, saw me and said, oh, but instead of peering, would you like transit? So I said, sure, thank you. So I got it. And then in May 2021, so a year later, I joined uh, Swiss IX. And then in October 2021, we got a new DLL. So we now have um, two transports oh, going. Sorry? Sorry. Oh, it's okay. So we got, so this is the situation right now. Um, I have two routers at home that connect to two different uh, paths, one via IPNG, that is basically my neighbor, and one via Open Factory. In the middle, there is the local utility. The local utility company provides uh, water, electricity, I think gas, and fiber. And so we use them, and we have that little switch you just saw is at the local exchange run by these people. And then we have two different transports that go to, for me, go to one data center, go to NTT at Zurich One, that I, the location I call it Zurich, and then I call it BTL using the United Nations um, nomenclature for places. So if you check, there is, a, there is a listing for every town, every location in the world that's given by the United Nations, and you can name your POPs according to that. So in... Uh, Zurich, I have uh, a transit that's from Open Factory. I have connection to Swiss IX, that's one gig. I have 10 gigs to CHIX, and then um, through CHIX, I reach uh, Mehrfarbig, which gives me another transit. And then I have a local transit close to home, well, actually at, work, at uh, Werke, here uh, by Open Factory, and I have my home network. And uh, as I mentioned during the tutorial in BGP, I have two users, two customers, two people I call customers. One is a friend of mine who has a little box and uh, um, he runs his own ASN from there, does a few things, and the other one is my girlfriend. So we have, um, we have decided, because I was mingling with it too much, so we have decided now I have maintenance windows and uh, I can't do, I can't touch anything if it's not on Wednesday evening and Friday evening. And because then if I break something, I have Thursday where she doesn't work at home, she works in the office, and Saturday to fix stuff. Now, then the problem was, okay, I, I have this. I built this, but if you take a step back, the moment I got the fiber to, to my house, I had to decide how I wanted to do that. And uh, here comes the, the interesting part. So first of all, you've seen it already, switches are all microtig for the moment. Um, <coughs> my neighbor uh, uses something different. He moved away from, from microtig switches, but I'm still using them. So CRS317, it has 16 SFP plus ports. It works, and I can't really complain about it. Uh, we have the small one that I showed you already. And uh, this is a, a small negligible part. But Router OS does a lot. You can, do, you can do pretty much everything with it. And they're cheap. And then this. This is funny. This is the workhorse for a lot and a lot and a lot of uh, small networks in and around Switzerland. Because you buy this, and it's a small format, one U uh, uh, machine, that has everything you need. It has six gigabit ports, two 10 gigabit, uh, well, ten, two SFP plus ports, and it, now it's way more expensive than it used to be, because you could buy it down for 600 francs, or 600 euros. It was, uh, you just ha have to add disks, and, uh, and RAM, 
and that's it. So for around like 900 francs, you could buy a full-fledged machine. And the good thing for this is that it's, you mount it on the back of a rack. Or actually, if you want, you can even stuff two of them, one in front and one in the back. So this was a very good candidate for, for it. And I, and I have um, three of them. So the, but you see, there is, there is one thing. Um, at least I noticed it much, much later than my, than my neighbor, is that um, at, at one point, somehow, many people reported that the two ports, the two onboard ports, they stopped working. They just blindly decide to stop working. So I added a, um, an external uh, network card with four additional ports, which also helps for more interconnection. And, uh, and I'm, and I have, I'm, uh, um, I'm happier actually that, that I did it. The other platform I have is this, that is a bit more exotic. It's, uh, it's an ARM um, with 32 gigs of RAM. It has four, four SS, SFP plus ports and one QSFP28 port, which theoretically from their specs could do 40 or 100 gig. Now, the small detail is that none of these work on FreeBSD or anything that's not Linux because you need its own, their own drivers. There is a person that's working on it. Um, I tried to convince also uh, Philip Taps to, to uh, have a look at it, but I was unsuccessful in convincing him to do that. Um, I, put, I put this in a Supermicro 1U enclosure, um, and I had to fight with it a bit because you need a lot of... Um, so when I used to run my ISP way more than 10 years ago, data centers had a much lower temperature. These days they run pretty hot. And so this, this, uh, this board had some issues. I had to add a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, fans to the, to the case to have it work. So I had a few times where it just turned off because it was overheating. Um, even here, I added another four ports, uh, four SFP plus ports, and it has all the connectivity it needs. So far, so good? Yes. So what, how are the interfaces connected? What I do is every router has bonded interfaces to the local switch. So then I, I'm, I have a lot more, basically I use the switches as a port multiplier for, for, for the routers. And it makes things much easier because anything I need, I can just plug it into the main router, just uh, tag a VLAN on it and just have it connect to the router or the other routers connected to the same switch. So this makes things much, much easier to manage. Then now the funny part with the, with the software. What, what do I run on these? I run FreeBSD 14.0 at the moment um, with uh, instead 15 on the ARM box because I, I try to stay on, on main, on current. I um, recompile every couple of weeks and I keep it up to date. So to see if there's any development in the drivers or anything. I use BERT mostly um, with OSPF v2, OSPF v3, BGP, and BFD. And I'll explain in a moment why I do BGP and BFD. Are there any questions so far? No? Do you know what I cannot do with BERT? that I mentioned in my title, in the title of my presentation. Yes? ISIS. ISIS, ISIS I cannot do. Um, I'll, I'll show you later. I actually have a testing environment where I'm, where I'm running ISIS because uh, the, I would like to, to try it one day in, in full production, but for now it stays in, a, in an isolated part of the network. Yes? Tom? Uh -huh. So, okay, so the question is if, uh, how do I use BFD and if I've seen any issues with it? Yeah. I haven't seen any issues, so BFD is, well, from BIRD. Uh, I use it <coughs> between loopbacks, 
and uh, I haven't had any any issues so far. No. At least there 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 were some issues reported at one point. There was a version of Bird that had issues, but then after that it was fixed, patched. Um, so. so how do I configure it? It's uh, OSPF to v2 and v3 to distribute the loopbacks. So I have um, different VLANs. I distribute my loopbacks all around them. And then I use BGP and BFD on those directly. So this makes it uh, very redundant. I have uh, BFD taking care of, uh, of uh, um, does anybody, everybody know what BFD does and what it is? No, okay, so when I run, when I run IBGP, or I run, also I could, do, I could run it on OSPF. I have a problem where my, the configuration I have is I use OSPF to redistribute my loopbacks. So my routers don't talk directly to each other on the direct interfaces, but they, my sessions run on, the, on, uh, on virtual interfaces, basically. And when that happens, I have no idea if the underlying network still works or not. BFD helps me figure that out. BFD is basically a hello, continuously, continuous hello protocol that goes between the two hosts, and it has a sub 10 milliseconds uh, fallback. So the moment BFD doesn't get a reply from the other side, it takes down my BGP session so everything gets rerouted all around it. And yes? Uh, I'm just relating a question from IRC. Yes. Uh, question regarding virtual features. Did you try Babel and its RTC-based read calls? Okay. Babel is a nice protocol. I, I haven't tested in my network here, but I used to use it for home net. And uh, I know my neighbor actually is using it now. There's, a, there's an article on ipng.ch about how he implemented it in, in his network or how he's testing it. But the difference I would have is that I run OSPF because, and, and Bubble is way more chatty than, than OSPF and uh, has, um, there were some, also some issues, if I remember correctly, that were exposed about how it behaves on Bird uh, recently. So no, I'm not using it. Um, it is an option and I know my neighbor has written about that. So on ipng.ch you should see data about it. So, how do I do the config management? Because that is, a, that is an interesting part of, uh, <coughs> of running a network. Um, I have a Python script that generates the bird config uh, once per day. So once a day, I have a, a something that takes a YAML file where I define, I have routers and neighbors and peers. With that, it fetches data from PNNDB. So from PNNDB, I get the AS sets, so the customer cone of my neighbors. And then the IRR, so I figure out how to, how, what I should accept from my neighbors. And then I generate the configuration for BIRD out of that. And then I push it to, to my routers via Ansible. This is very, very similar to Coloclue. Coloclue is an organization in the Netherlands where you um, you can become a member and you get a cheap uh, rec space. And so they have a network committee that runs. That's where you basically find people who work in most of the major ISPs all around the Netherlands. And it's a testing ground for many, many things. Actually, Coloclue is funny because if you want to peer with them, you if you share an internet exchange with them, you don't have to send an email, you don't have to ask for it, you do a pull request on GitHub. Because then you, you get into, basically you, you add your ASN to their config file, and then uh, when, when, you pull it, um, when your pull, it, pull request is accepted, the, gen, the new config file gets generated and pushed to, the, to their routers. So you don't have to send any emails, there's no human interaction in that. Um, I, I'm not at that level. I have um, I do everything manually for the moment, and one day I hope I can publish this script because uh, 
for now, it's full of uh, hacky parts, and I'm not really proud of that. Um, so I know, I know Tom, Tom has asked me a few times if I could share that, but I'm not proud enough at the moment to do it. Yes? What are you using as the back end? Something like Netbox or? No. Uh, so the question is if I'm using anything as back end. I don't have Netbox running. I don't have any other back end. Uh, it's, a, it's a small network. So I keep everything in CSV files, okay. not even Excel. Um, but this one is a, this is just a YAML file where, where I list, uh, basically there is a um, per router. For, oh. for I thought you meant you generated the YAML. No, 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 no. No, I generate the config file. The YAML, I edit it. But the next step that I have in mind is to have a GUI for creating the YAML file, because that could help a lot of people. If I, if I have a GUI where I say, on this router, <clears throat> I peer with this AS, this AS, this AS, this AS, and then it generates the YAML file that then generates the rest of the configuration, then that might help a lot of people who don't want to interact with routers. And I've seen that being helpful in many places. Um, so in my, my configuration, when it gets generated, actually takes the configuration, takes the data from the internet routing registry, and then applies also uh, RPKI ROV. It does, uh, it checks that the AS path is not long, uh, not, not too long. So um, I have 50 as my, as the largest AS path I accept. I accept up to slash 24, up to slash 48 for V6, and all the others, the other uh, small features there. Then, what other uh, so software runs on every router? It's actually pretty simple, and I was, uh, when, I, when I looked at it, I actually looked a few times, because I, uh, I thought there should have been more. But no, I run BIRD, I run PMACCT. Do you know what it does? Does anybody, does everybody know PMACCT? Basically, flow analysis. Um, I use I use PMECCT. I have a specific slide about it later, for um, sending my flows to Tim Cumry, so that they can analyze them, give me a nice GUI that shows me colors about how, where my traffic goes. Uh, SNMPD, NRPE for my very old school uh, monitoring stuff, monitoring system, and then here comes the the interesting part. I have for every router, a jail for its own resolver. Because I figured I could run multiple resolvers and do and also do an anycast uh, configuration for them. Then a jail for a relying party for RPKI, so what's called a validator. And there I flip a coin when I set up the, the routers. It, bless you, it's either a routinator or fort, depending on coin flip. I just want to have a bit of diversity, multiple different softwares, because um, they all had issues in the past, so it's better to have um, different ones. A jail for secondary MX, and there I just use Postfix, and a jail for authoritative DNS, because I run everything uh, in-house. So, and there I use just bind with DNSSEC. Uh, any question about any of this? Now, having the, the jails uh, have all public public IPs, um, the only exception is the resolver here that is anycast inside the network, but the rest is all, it all has its own IP address. Yes? I was going to ask about uh, IP address assignment. Just yeah. I don't see DHCP on there, and so no. I'm just wondering if you're doing it automatically or not. It's all static, because yeah. I'm, I'm lucky. I have, I got a slash 22. I'm the only user. So, um, I've done certain allocation. I've done a bit of sparse allocation, so I don't really need to worry about anything. There is a small chunk of address space that I gave to my neighbor for its out of bound, out of band management. So he uses my network to reach his house in case of issues, and we have a cross situation where I do the same with him. But other than that, it's all my stuff, and especially then for IPv6. I have actually currently not only have one slash 29, but I have two. I transferred one from a friend who was closing his LAR. And so 
there I really don't have any, any issues. So every router gets a slash 48 by itself. And uh, yeah. so there is no, no reason to, to be cheap on that. Now, what I do, this is something particular, something that I, um, <coughs> it was actually one of the things that I said I really need to put in the slides. Um, because this is overlooked by a lot of people building their own routers. Um, I use CPU set to bind SSHD to a specific processor core. So that will just be used by SSH because in case of uh, DDoS attack, you want to have op uh, empty resources to just uh, connect to your box and uh, maybe just take an interface down. If you can't reach it physically to unplug something or do something, then you want to be able to uh, at least get into get in via SSH and do uh, and do your maintenance there and do something because otherwise your it might happen so the the usual conversation that I have with Tom is that micro uh, software routers and then in case of DDoS attack you cannot really reach them you cannot do anything on them because the processors are all stuck in uh, in uh, DDoS land. Um, this is a small trick you can take. So you bind uh, SSH and then a shell process to it and to one, one dedicated CPU. You're not going to use it for anything else, but you have plenty. And especially in my case, I don't care about carrying hundreds of gigabits on these routers. I care about, I, I only use a, a few megabits uh, now and then. And so I don't mind. Then uh, I followed some of the recommendations from uh, Olivier Cachard Labbé, um, where he has this um, uh, wiki page that he has, has been maintaining for a few years. There's a paper from 2018 that he presented at Asia BSD Con as well about uh, specific sys controls you want you want to set to improve your networking perform performance on your yes. Yes. Do you use NetGraph to collect the Netflow and IP address data? No, I use PMA, PMA CCT. Okay. So the question is if I use uh, a yeah. NetGraph to, col to collect flow data? No, I use PMA CCT. Okay. And how do you handle service health checks for any cast of outlets? That one I don't know. I don't do it. I do it. I, no, I do it locally on the machine itself. <clears throat> So I don't do it from, from remote, but I do it via, via an RPE or directly on the machine. Okay. And, uh, oh, sorry. Do you change the default CPU set to free up the CPU? Mm. Free up the yes, well, you have to remove it from the default and then put SSH into the other. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yes. So, um, actually, there was the slide about flow collection right after that. And um, CCT is configured to send data to Team Camry. There's a specific um, service you can, you can use, and it's for free. You're sending data to someone else about your network, yes. But um, basically, you, you help the rest of the community because Team Camry provides uh, also a lot of data about, uh, about um, DDoS attacks and uh, anything. Now, the um, repository that I linked is mine instead of the Team Camry one because I did a, I actually added the, the configuration for PME CCT in there and they haven't uh, pulled it into their, uh, their repository yet. One day, and this also answers the, one of the questions I got, one day I will configure Acquarado or something similar, which is a um, flow analysis software that uh, that is now very, very uh, popular. What do you use, Tom, for these? NTOP, OK. So NTOP is pretty heavy. And my, one of the reasons for me for not running something in-house in is because this software are usually, is usually pretty heavy. NFSEN. NFSEN is uh, not as heavy as NTOP, but still requires a lot of uh, 
resources. So I, my, this was a sort of an executive decision. Let's not run anything at home. Let's just rely on someone else. Then more. What else do I have? Um, there's BPP. <coughs> so if you go and check ipng.ch, that is my neighbor, um, he does a lot of work on VPP, which is a, a something that started in, in uh, Linux, high performance user space network stack, and uh, he has been able to do multiple hundred gigs on common hardware of rooted, um, rooted packets. Um, this was the big difference where he was all he was always come out almost mocking me for not using Linux, and, uh, where I don't need I don't need all the all the traffic. I it's, I have two users, as I said, three including myself. So there uh, I was there thinking, okay, one day maybe I'll have a look at VPP. But now, starting November twenty three. Um, there is a porting effort for uh, VPP on FreeBSD. It's sponsored by the FreeBSD Foundation. And actually even uh, Pim, a neighbor wrote about it, he tested it, found some issues, and he's, uh, he's been uh, talking to, uh, to Tom, Tom Jones, about that. And I have one router testing it, but I still haven't put too much load on it. because. Uh, I don't have the super infrastructure that my neighbor has for doing all the testing. So he has a setup that's where you can just plug two cables and you test the whole, uh, whole infrastructure that's always ready to, to run. So this would probably change the way I do things the moment it hits fully the, um, the FreeBSD repository because um, VPP also includes uh, a NAT64 daemon. So you could also do NAT64 directly in, uh, in there. Now monitoring, I use good old Nagios. Notifications though go via Telegram because then I can just uh, hold my phone and do, uh, Adam? Yeah, I forgot the previous slide, I apologize, this is strictly your talk. It's okay. DPDK. The TSM guy, uh, Jim Thompson. Yes. That was, the, and that was part of the that was part of the netgraph promise was you could have it come in, translate through LTP, and come out and entirely at one level with no context switch. And that we were capable of doing quite a lot of processing without a context switch, and that was in my testing back in the day when things were a lot slower. Like now, it can do a lot of things with no switch. There's not. Is <laughs> okay, a anyway, what I know is that off, like if you, if I go back and, uh, and I look at the, uh, no, where is it, the, uh, these, the, if you follow the recommendations from, from Olivier, you get to a point where you already are doing um, um, all, uh, up to 40 gigs, basically, of, uh, without touching too much in, in the system. Then... Um, the point is that the <coughs> some people with VPP has started going, have they started going all, uh, out of bounds in a way, so going hundreds of gigs, and uh, and then you feel like you're left behind in a way. When you when you see when you see some uh, some numbers, yeah, and uh, and you can't do them, you feel a bit left out in that sense. But um, it's coming, so. Uh, one day we'll, we'll see that. I haven't tested too much, as I said. 
what I do is I run monitoring, I run Nagios, that's an external instance running from another network. So I get a view of how the internet sees me. I get notifications via Telegram, so then uh, I can integrate it into a different flow and I have a group uh, with other people as well. I run smoke ping, and if you want to have a, a look here, I have an extensive list of different endpoints. So I have, um, I generate daily a configuration that has all the ripe atlas, um, um, the anchors. So you see the view from my network all the way to the rest of the world in, uh, in almost all the countries. And then I use BGP Alerter, which is a, um, it's a software that looks at uh, real-time data on BGP collectors. And then if there's any state change in BGP, I get a notification so I can act upon it if, if it really is a change that should not have happened. Um, gives me all information about potential hijacks to my prefix and other stuff. And this also, this is a node uh, application that also runs on, on FreeBSD, although the author doesn't really support it. Then out of band man management, uh, that's also a question that I get pretty often. I run a Raspberry Pi with FreeBSD connected to a separate switch uh, that's shared with another ISP. Um, dedicated IP address, so I, I connect with uh, WireGuard and I have access to the IPMI interfaces of the supermicros. And I do both, I do it both at home and in the data center. And um, at the exchange, uh, the local exchange, we have an APU that's from, uh, from PIM um, with a serial that goes directly into the switch. And also we actually have a serial that goes into the local router from, from, uh, from Open Factory to, to help in case there's any issue. And then what, what do I have as future work? Uh, ISIS, I mentioned it at the beginning. I was delayed in, uh, with some work recently, otherwise I would have had this uh, tested fully. Um, there was no MicroTik support until recent, so if you wanted to get the switches involved in the ISIS topology, you couldn't do that. But in the um, last few releases of uh, Router OS, there is support, and uh, people are commenting that it actually works. Uh, so that should be. But that would require a move to FRR everywhere because uh, BERT does not support ISIS. It's not in the works even. It's not in their, um, in the, uh, it's not in, uh, in their agenda. They want to get uh, BERT 3 done before they look at anything new. Um, I have a test environment set up with Container Lab where I run FRR with a uh, full ISIS topology and I'm uh, testing it. Um, to see the configurations. And then the next steps would be to add more exchanges. I'd like to join uh, AMZIX and MIX, so go a bit north and a bit south. Um, but that this also has uh, its own costs. So extreme future work. What would I like to achieve one day is to go IPv6 mostly. I do have a VLAN um, that also has a dedicated um, uh, how do you, um, dedicated um, access point where I do IPv6 only, but that's one test. IPv6 mostly means having NAT64 working and, uh, and uh, all the chain of resolvers and everything only in v6. Uh, maybe use VPP everywhere one day. And last is a move from 10 gig, because today we have uh, 10 gig interfaces I'd like maybe to see if we can move to 100 gig, because that would be a nice talk to do one day. Um, the only limitation we have is that we need bidirectional, bidirectional optics, and they are more expensive than the normal optics, of course. So that brings that brings some some issues in terms of in monetary uh, terms. Where can you find more information? Uh, I have a website for the ASN. You can find more information on Peering DB. And then I have a short summary. What, do I, what else do I run? I run BGP, but I also run my own mail server. And I haven't yet listened to uh, Michael Lucas about that. So that's something I will have to do. DNS, I run my calendar because I didn't want to depend from anyone. 
myself and some friends. I also have a BGP set up to UTRS from Team Camry for DDoS information. So what you do is you receive announcements made by other people who run UTRS, and you can uh, um, sinkhole, black hole those, uh, those prefixes. So it's used for distributing DDoS protection information. Um, I have a friend who hosts his own hardware with personal services uh, there. And now uh, a small bit about the costs, because people always ask me, so how much does this cost? Costs go for the co-location, because I have a little bit of space in a, in a data center. The highest cost is actually the patches. The cables that go from my rack to Swiss IX, from my rack to Cogent, because I have a port at uh, on the Cogent, yes? Who's the data center operator? NTT. So the question is, who's the data center operator? I have NTT. Um, there, there are other options around Zurich, uh, Interaction, there is um, Equinix, there's pretty much everyone. But NTT is the one where the, the patches are the cheapest. It's uh, 55 francs per month, I think. Um, the fiber cost coming to our house is actually negligible. It's less than half of what we pay for a patch inside the data center in, uh, in there. So it's about 25 francs. The hardware and power are also not that high. Luckily, Switzerland has a lot of uh, renewable power. Um, this is a funny, funny thing is not only renewable, but we have nuclear. And we live close enough that every three years we get uh, iodine pills delivered by mail by the government to uh, take them only if instructed by the government. Sorry? Yeah, almost like it down here in Ottawa. How far is East River? It's Chalk River. Or Chalk River to Papa. Yeah, we have, we're less than 50 kilometers so from nuclear reactors, I think. So, and we get, we get, uh, get pills. So, all in all, this comes out at uh, less than 500 francs a month. Uh, and as I said uh, in, at the very beginning, we are very lucky because we can do this. And then the, the cost factor is a secondary factor. Uh, you have a question? You said you got your patch from 2004 and 2019. <coughs> yeah. If you were to request that today, would you still be able to get something like that? No. No. Uh, and we haven't been able to get that. In so, the quest, so the question is, um, I, I mentioned that I have my own uh, slash, 20, uh, slash 22 IPv4 and slash 29 V6. Would I be able to get them these days? No. Well, V6 for sure. V6, yes, but, uh, but V4, no. It, it's been easily five years or six years since you could get a 22. In... Yes, but you can get, so in North America, if you request IPv6, then you can get a small IPv4 network to, to, to run v4. Still, that's still the case, but it's, it's a dedicated uh, part of the address space you get it from. In, uh, in uh, Europe, so in Ripeland, we have run out of addresses. So if you become a member, you get, and you want IPv4, you join a waiting list, but the first Entity who joined the waiting list has been there for more than a year and a half, as far as I remember. In North America, they've, they've, they've drained all the waiting lists, but for a long time, like you have to justify, like you, yep. even back then, like when they gave out slash 22, they would not have given you one because you'd have to show how you were going to use it. Yep. And that, when, that I, when I received it. Like 2000. Yes, so actually it's funny, I have a, I, because recently there were discussions about, um, in the RIPE region, about the charging scheme for next year, and someone claimed that RIPE was the most expensive one. I actually wrote, did a comparison of how much it would cost with my resources to be in different RIRs, and um, the most expensive one is uh, LACNIC, where I would pay 28,000 a, a year, Dollars. Um, that would be one thousand a year. Here it would be two two thousand. Two thousand. So if it's one slash twenty two, it's one thousand. Um, and the two slash twenty two is. 2, yes, 000. yes, but I have one slash twenty two, and then I have the slash twenty nine IPv six. Oh, so yeah, if you only had a thirty two of, 
IPv6 yes. would be one Yes, well, but I, I did a comparison. So I, in RIPE I pay uh, 1,500, and uh, here I would pay $2,000. I would pay 2,000 in Afrinic if I remember correctly, and then there would be uh, APNIC would be 3,700 euros, and uh, LACNIC is the most expensive one, where my IPv6 brings it up to $28,000. But if I were to cut away one slash 29, so become like the normal package uh, membership in Europe, I would still be paying 14,000 per year. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Because I'm, I, I have space. If you uh, if you want to exchange space, we can we can also fig figure that out. So, yeah. Thank you for the offer. Yeah. Uh, two more questions for Craig. Yes. Uh, what advantage do you expect from ISIS? The advantage from my SIS that I expect is that I could try to get rid of IPv4 completely in my network. So I could do without, because ISIS is not a full layer three, it goes down to layer two. And I could probably get rid of V4, and, uh, and then test a protocol that, that gives me more capabilities in terms of, uh, well, larger networks as well. That I haven't seen, but I, I haven't I heard. But that's a that's a very old one. I mean, I haven't seen it very recently, as you know. Okay, so the question was if uh, if FRR eight has fixed a bug where if you would lose a large peer with a lot of uh, prefixes, it would uh, create a an, a full BGP issue and your. Uh, I, I see a similar sort of thing you know, on my neural to the router. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I've I really found FRR, Quagga before it, to be like the fastest BGP speaker. Yeah. Like, like there, there, are, there, are, there are not even Cisco's that come close to the speed of table generation. Like, you got, uh, there's a good reason for that. When you're running FRR, if you're running FRR on a commodity, usually server processor, so you've got like a Xeon Silver or a Xeon Gold or whatever, even if it's an i5 CPU, doing all the calculations. The CPUs they didn't do even a current gen Cisco XDX uh, router is about okay. I'm gonna go out on a limb here. Roughly able to process things like Red Up. About as fast as I would expect a first or second gen i5 standard. I, I don't know where that's going. My, my, my sort of, you know, looking at my peers, the fastest peers are like, you know, 12 to 15 seconds for 800,000 messages. Yep. Whereas, whereas, you know, FRR can do it in three or four, but the slowest peers can be several minutes if you have a low signal. Mm -hmm. Software. So it, they put all the money into the onboard ASICs that are doing the 400 bit routers and hardware speeds. And then I don't know, maybe they had more money left over to put in that piece of process. I'll, I'll also say, in terms of like forwarding speed, the most interesting thing I found, and you're, you're playing with some reasonably strange hardware there, mm -hmm. is you can take the same interface and two different motherboards.
total forwarding ability, especially when you're not when you're not looking at say large packet or average packet forwarding. When you're like testing your DDoS uh, reliability, yeah. oh, you, you use an iMix. No? More by packet. Oh no, you use more an iMix from for that, not just a uh, 64 byte. No, I, I'm mm -hmm. just saying that the ultimate test is your 64 byte mm -hmm. passing, but that different motherboards can have wildly different oh, abilities yeah. to handle that stuff. True. Especially once you get into the multi-CPU motherboard, because then you have to be careful which thing from which. Yeah, it does help if you can tell previous B to, to, to which the right CPU is talking to the right card. Yeah. There's also a degree of nonsense. I mean, I think a bar standard. Some of those options will have easily a 10 or 100 fold effect on PCI latency security. Uh, power saving up. If you turn on anything other than, uh, forget my language, bolt to the wall mode, um, the, the internal latency of a dart goes up massively, like 500 fold. The ones, the, the, the ones embedded in the systems are Intel cards, but those are also the ones that at one point sometimes sometimes just stop working. No idea, but I can I can show you. I have a box where I can we can have a look and I can yeah. reboot it as much as we want. So. No, no, uh, no. I you. Yeah, no, no. I just. Okay. But I had a question. There was a question here from the. So court. You said in the oh, sorry. You said in the future you wanted to put a hundred gig network in as one of your future. So do yeah. you actually have a use case, or no. is this intellectual curiosity? It's curiosity. It's it would be fun to to go around and talk about having a hundred gig to the home, yeah. because now people go around for from. The local uh, ISP for minute seven, they went around talking about 25 gig to the home. Then we could go around and talk about 100 gig to the home, or maybe even more. Who knows? Well, we can do uh, the single TCP streamers. Yeah, yeah, but that's we know. I mean, I, I I'm not <laughs> I'm not using I'm not using 100 megabits of the of the 10 gigabits I have now. So it's it's purely useless in a way. I know. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Is there a list of good or bad boards on their settings? A list of good or bad boards? Mm. It changes every year. Yeah. Changes every year. I mean, yeah. the good thing yeah. about the, the super micros that I showed is that that hasn't changed since 2019. I first looked at them, yeah. and they still sell them. And it's a, it's a platform you can rely on. I found that super micros generally test better than Anyway. Is there certain applications yet? Yeah, well, for network. Right. Okay, we have the second question. Because we're also running out of time. Huh? Yes, we are. Um, is it still recommended to disable hyper threading? On Sorry? Is it still recommended to disable hyper threading on previous Um I have never. No. Uh, so the question is if it's still recommended to disable hyper threading on routers? No. I think that was a thing. 
It was a thing because of Colin some years ago as well. Yeah, flip. Yes? Well, when you're dealing with local actors trying to figure out what local actors are doing, sure. But when you're dealing with packets being routed, exactly. packets can't tell. Any other questions? No? Then I have my, well, I had one last um, slide about community racks, but I, I mentioned them. There's Coloclu. I pointed directly to the English website. Um, you, anyone can become a member and you pay for the units you, you put there. In Zurich we have communityrack.org, which is also a, an association. You can join it, get some space. And it's one final consideration, it's incredible how much help you get from the community once you're part of it. Uh, and being part of, for example, Swinog or any other places. I mentioned it, I asked uh, for peering to a couple of entities and some of them keep, even came back to me asking if I wanted to turn the peering into transit just for free because it's a personal ASN, because they, they know me out of the community and um, it's really, really incredible. Um, so this is uh, basically it and uh, we've, I've already had questions. We are out of time. But so I'll be here also tomorrow, later today. And so thank you very much for being here. And uh, it wasn't too technical, but it's one of those presentations where I wanted to show you what you can do. And, uh, and it, uh, it doesn't have to be to go into the deep, deep to do a deep dive. But um, this, is, uh, this is something that could be replicated in other places, maybe not all the way to the home, but uh, in a data center for sure you can you can rent a VM somewhere and run your own uh, run your own stuff using using FreeBSD using OpenBSD, and uh, you can do anything. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you.